Are coyotes and wolves different species? Well, <laughs> the answer to that question is going to all depend on your definition of what a species is. And I've been dealing with that in my class uh, quite a bit over the last couple of weeks. Um, we've, been, we've talked about different species concepts. We've talked about how to identify species, the different tools we have for identifying species as different either genomic lineages or morphotypes or I mean we could go on and on with the different ways to describe and sort of get a handle on what a species is. But let's, I decided today when I came to class I, I showed him some brand new data, a paper that just came out yesterday and I wanted to illustrate just how messy this question of is what is a species and this goes along with our discussion about what how are species formed or how are species made. And so the topic is coyotes and eastern gray wolves, uh, the nature of their relationship with one another. We're just going to take a brief look at this paper that I just showed, I, I just spent 10 minutes talking about in class today, that looks at 25 genomes sequenced from eastern gray wolves and compares those to other genomes that have been sequenced from other coyotes and wolves in North America to try to tease out this question, what exactly are wolves and coyotes? Um, and how should we use those terms, uh, species, subspecies, hybrids, and so forth, in this complex situation or interaction between these, things, these organisms? All right, let's take a look at that coming up next. All right, so here's our paper, Tracing Eastern Wolf Origins from Whole Genome Data in the Context of Extensive Hybridization. The title gives away a lot of the story, right? We're gonna look at the origins of the Eastern Wolf as opposed to the Western or Gray Wolf. Uh, and we're gonna look at whole genome data, right? They've sequenced the entire genome. And the context is hybridization. So yes, there has been hybridization among different wolves and between wolves and coyotes. And that is going to draw us to the primary issue, which is what, what is a species? If, if these organisms can hybridize with one another, what maintains their genetic differences such that we could continue to describe wolves and coyotes as being different things? All right, this is a, a piece of work published in the, I think it's uh, Molecular Biology and Evolution uh, by a number of authors, all of which are uh, at Canadian institutions, but the primary uh, lab is from Christopher Kyle, who's at uh, Trent University in Ontario, Canada. And let me read a little bit, well, maybe the whole abstract to get a sense for what's happening here. Southeastern Canada is inhabited by an amalgam, all right, of hybridizing wolf-like canids. So there you go. There's an amalgam of hybridizing, hybridizing wolf-like canids. So canids, members of this broader group, or genus Canis, of which there have been named many species, individual members of that genus. But there's this amalgam of hybridizing wolf-like canids. The wolf is a particular species, right? Canis lupus. And, but there seems to be an amalgam of hybridized wolves. So what are they hybridizing with? In this case, we're gonna find out they're hybridizing with coyotes. And so they're chi wolves or combinations of coyotes and wolves. This raises fundamental questions regarding their, taxono their taxonomy, like what exactly should we call them? That's what taxonomy is, all right? Our, our labels, our names that we give them in order so, so that we can say, oh, that's a that, you know, in my backyard. What about their origins? Well, where did they come from? How are they related to one another? Where, when did they share some kind of common ancestry? The timing of their hybridization events, well, it looks like we have two different recognizable morphotypes here, morphological species, things that you and I could look at and go, that's a coyote and that's a wolf because I recognize these features. But we also recognize that there's hybridization events and even people just looking at external features can tell there's hybridization because there's mixtures of characters sometimes, especially in the area. I live in Northeast Ohio and we have coyotes. I've had coyotes in my backyard. Uh, and we know that the coyotes in this particular area have a little bit of wolf in them. They're mostly coyote, but they're a little bit of wolf as well. And I've even sequenced some genes from the coyotes in this region in order to look for uh, characteristic uh, alleles, let's say, or variants that are from wolves. So now there are these things called eastern wolves. 
that are different enough from those out west or western North America that they've been given a different species name by some biologist, right? Recognized as separate species, right? Those eastern wolves specifically have been the subject of significant controversy. Yes, are they really a different species or not, right? Either viewed as distinct taxonomic entities, completely separate species, in which case they might be of conservation concern because there's not very many of them. You know? So is this an endangered species? Well, if, if it's an, an endangered species, only endangered if it's endangered, it's in danger of going extinct, right? And if they're just a variety of gray wolf, which is all over North America, then they're not really that rare, and so they're not endangered. But if they actually are a different species, well, there aren't that many of them, and so maybe they are endangered. Uh, or are you know are they of recent hybrid origin with coyotes, right? Canis latrans, or the gray wolves, Canis lupus. If they're a separate species, maybe they've also hybridized as well, in which case they're becoming more like Canis lupus over time. Are they going to maintain their specific identity as different species? Right? You get any idea that what a species is is going to get kind of muddled? All right, it's an amalgam. Genes are flying around all over the place. Well, variants are being moved from one population to another, in which case we have mixing of gene pools between potentially different species. And so what maintains species differences? Where do the species differences come from anyway? Like how do they become distinctive species if we're going to call those species? Mitochondrial DNA, DNA analysis has shown some evidence that eastern wolves uh, being North American evolved canids, meaning they're a separate lineage, right? The mitochondrial DNA only passed down by the female uh, wolves in eastern wolves seems to be distinct. It seems to be all of them have a distinct type of mitochondrial DNA versus ones that are the, the gray wolves. However, in contrast, nuclear genome studies indicate eastern wolves are at best described as a hybrid entity. They seem to have mixtures of, they seem to be clearly related to western wolves or gray wolves. They have some distinctive alleles, variants, making them unique, giving them some unique characteristics. On the other hand, they also have some distinct alleles or variants that appear to have come from coyotes. And so they're a mixture uh, with coyotes. But the timing of these hybridization events isn't clear. To test hypotheses related to these competing findings, we sequenced whole genomes of 25 individuals. So we're going to look at 25 individuals of eastern wolves, representing the extent of Canadian wolf-like canid types of known origin and levels of contemporary hybridization. So they're looking for uh, inside the genomes to see if, like, can we tease out this data? Here we present data describing here we present data describing eastern wolves as a distinct taxonomic entity that evolved separately from gray wolves for the past 67,000 years with an admixture event with coyotes 37,000 years ago. So their primary finding is that we find that in looking at the entire genome, billions of base pairs and thousands of genes and lots more variants than previous studies have looked at, we find that we can pool all the eastern wolves into, uh, a, a, into a set of, into a set of, their set of genomes have distinctive elements to it as opposed to other wolves. So they appear to be two separately evolving genomic lineages. That's one way of defining species. And then there seems to be an admixture event with coyotes, specifically with the eastern wolves. And they estimate that happened 37,000 years ago where there was some interaction, all right, gene flow, we'd call it, between coyotes and wolves. So mating between the two such that the genomes were mixed. And they can see that mixture now being passed down to the present day eastern wolves. Sort of similar to the Neanderthal story, right? If Neanderthals are genetically distinct from all modern humans, uh, and yet there are little pieces of the Neanderthal genome that are in some modern human uh, genomes. And that's thought to be the result of the separate lineage crossing over or horizontally transferring a portion of the genome into modern humans and then that being transferred vertically from generation to generation all the way to the present day such that some of us have Neanderthal DNA in us. You could say that these eastern wolves 
were a distinct, separate lineage from gray wolves. And I think they're saying it, they're distinct enough genetically and morphologically. There's enough other physical appearance differences that it seems reasonable to call them a different species, a different evolving lineage or genetic lineage. But that genetic lineage has been tainted somewhat by the infusion of genes from uh, coyotes and potentially other gray wolves at a later time, bring, sprinkling a few more gray wolf genes or variants back into the eastern wolf population. Um, we show the Great Lakes wolves, a different lineage, originated as a mixture of gray wolves and eastern wolves. So they're saying potentially these things that have been identified by people just looking at the animals, and there's a subset of wolves that has been called the Great Lakes wolves, um, mostly north of the Great Lakes here because we don't have wolves in this particular area. So those Great Lake wolves, which already look like they're different than either of the other two, they find looking at the genome information from them that it looks like they're a mixture of the gray wolf and the eastern wolf. So they're, they're sort of the hybrid product of the two. And they think this only happened just recently, like after the related glaciation, because remember all this area, I'm in northern Ohio, so this area was covered with ice, and therefore all populations of wolves and coyotes and everything in North America were pushed south. And then as they began to move back up north, there, were more, there may have been opportunities for mixtures uh, of these um, different species of wolves uh, when they were in greater contact with each other. And now that there's more you know, geographical space for them, um, that mix, the remnants of those hybrids are staying in this sort of central area above the Great Lakes. Um, yeah, so I don't want to go on and on and on here. So let's just go all the way down to the figures because that's all we're going to look at. Just going to look at some figures. First, I want to show you a bunch of different canid types, right? So of the canis, the genus canis, We've got uh, eastern coyotes. We have western coyotes. Um, well, that would be blue. And we've got uh, the gray wolf in the Arctic. And we have what's called the eastern wolf, right? And we have the Great Lakes wolf. And there's something called the Mexican wolf, which is a very distinctive variety of wolf. And this paper doesn't really delve into that. But uh, the genetics of that suggests they're quite different than all the other wolves, so that might actually be different species as well and has been giving a species name, and some people recognize it, some people don't recognize it. It depends, again, on <laughs> what do you think a species is, <laughs> how different you have to be to dif be a different species. After all, it's pretty obvious that all of these are capable of mating with one another and producing offspring. And if your definition of a species is, is the biological species concept, one of the most common species concepts used for animals in particular, and that is the ability to reproduce and have offspring, all right? If you can do that, that shows you have a shared gene pool in the sense that your genes are similar enough that uh, you can have offspring with them. Well, that, that's, that suggests you're the same species. Um, but coyotes and wolves in some places live in close, uh, in the same area Right? But they don't have anything to do with each other. Right? They, differ, they have different hunting habits. Uh, they have very different behaviors. Right? It's not, they're not seen to like gather together or intermingle with one another. So what happens is even though they are potentially, if they were forced to hybridize with one another, they could produce offspring. And that appears to have happened at different times in the past, but it, happens, it appears to happen very rarely. And since it happens very rarely, their gene pools really aren't mixed. And since their gene pools aren't mixed very often, each gene pool has the opportunity to evolve, right? It has the chance to adapt. Um, selection is occurring, and selection picks different alleles in different populations, causing them to become more and more genetically distinct over time. And of course, coyotes have mutations, gray wolves have mutations, Eastern wolves have mutations, Mexican wolves have mutations, and as long as they're not sharing those mutations very much with other populations, that makes each one of them more and more distinct from one another, and therefore more and more and more like a new species, a different species. And depending on your species concept or what characters you think, to, what characters you identify species by, 
you might call it a species, whereas somebody else doesn't agree and they, they want to have other characters um, to, to augment their species definition. All right, we're interested in this uh, square box here, which are basically the species of the Great Lakes wolf, the Eastern wolf, and regular wolves and coyotes. Okay, so that's our study group. Let me come down here and we look at uh, figure A right here. That is uh, the split tree network of six million autosomal SNPs. Okay, six million autosomal SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphism. So when they sequence the entire genome of all these different wolves and coyotes, they find six million different locations in the genome where there are variants, right? This has got an A, that one's got a T, somebody else has something else at particular sites. Six million different locations where there's variation. I mean, the genomes are billions of base pairs in size, which means that for most of the genome, uh, they're exactly the same, right? Coyotes, wolves, red wolves, Mexican wolves, they have the exact same sequence, just like you and I have nearly the exact same sequence, but we have some variants, right? We're 99 point something percent similar. And so are all these species. Uh, not that you and I are different species. Um, they actually have more, much more differences uh, between them than any two human beings have on Earth, far more. Um, all right, so the upshot here is that um, you have coyotes and you have eastern coyotes. And the eastern coyotes and the other coyotes, which are primarily western coyotes, all, all the way over to the Midwest somewhat, um, they tend to group with one another. So it appears there are two different lineages. Now, whether you want to call them different species or not, again, you'd have to decide how much difference genetically and morphologically you need to have to call them different species. Most people lump them all together as the same species and maybe call them varieties, right? They're this species, variety that, variety this. Um, the red wolf is a fairly distinct lineage, which could be given a different name. And then you have the gray wolf and you have the Great Lakes wolf and you have the eastern wolves. Um, collectively, all the wolves are similar to one another compared to the coyotes. Uh, well, except the red wolf, which is which is sort of its, its own distinct thing. But those other wolves are all relatively similar to another, but within all those wolves, there's definitely groupings of them, such that the eastern wolf and the gray wolf could be considered genetically distinct and isolated, and since they have morphological differences, could be given different species names. Um, this box B right here, it has, um, that is the, uh, it's multidimensional scaling analysis, okay, of FST values. Uh, you don't really need to know what the axes represent. All you need to know is the dots represent populations of things that we identify visually, right? And we have identified as different things like red wolves and eastern coyotes and uh, gray wolves and the eastern wolf. Uh, and down here is the Mexican wolf. And all you need to get from this particular figure is each dot, the closer the dots are together, the more genetically similar they are to one another. In other words, there's more things that they have in common um, to each other. And what you generally have is you have wolves over here, you've got coyotes over here. So the coyotes that are distinctive, but yet they're all coyotes. And these things are all wolves, and yet they're wolves. But interestingly, you see here, uh, you got the Mexican wolf way, way out here in a different spot. And actually, the red wolf, I, I'm sorry, the red wolf is over here closer to the, um, the coyotes, right? So even though it's called a wolf, it actually has more coyote characteristics, but it's distinct from the other coyotes. All right, so that just kind of visually gives you an idea that, yes, there's some variation and differences. But obviously some populations are much more similar to one another than they are to others. So where do you draw the line here in terms of where the, what species are? That's the question we're asking, right? And again, that's why you can have differences of opinion about this because there's no universally agreed upon definition of exactly how you should define what a species is. All right, we're getting to the, the good stuff here. There's two more figures. This one I want to point out because if you watched my video on mammoths, right, 23 new mammoth genomes that was just published, right? And I just did that a couple days ago. And one of the things I talked about in that paper was the, the amount of genetic variation, right? The amount of heterozygosity 
in the population. So that's how many variant alleles are present within an individual population uh, or within individuals, how many heterozygous uh, sites they have in those genomes. And I mentioned that these different elephants, the different mammoths, right? Well, the mammoths and the African elephant and the Asian elephant, they all have a similar amount of genetic heterozygosity, right? Variation. And now I'm thinking about that. I went back and looked at that mammoth paper and I had misdescribed the variation there. Here, they also have heterozygous, uh, heterozygosity. That's what's below this line right here. And the number right down here is, you see 0 0.001, actually it's like 0 0.002 is about where they all come down to. So that would be two out of every 1,000 base pairs, right? That means if you have to, you have to go down, if you go down 1,000 base pairs of the genome, for every 1,000 base pairs you go, you'll find two sites that are variable, right, within that particular genome, right? They're heterozygous. So there's two variants in that particular genome. Remember, you have two copies of your genome. So that means that you're different. Your mom and your dad gave you different versions. That amount of variation, to give you some sense of what we're talking about, that amount of variation is close to double the amount of variation between, say, a typical human genome and the amount of variation that you and I have. Right? So, and you can see all these different species have kind of similar amounts of variation. So they're not, they haven't lost a ton of variation. In fact, canids have a lot of variation overall. Now, variation has to do with uh, the, a couple properties of variation is the longer a species has been around, especially if the species has had a lot of individuals, right? So the populations are relatively large. If you have a relatively large population and you've been around for a long time, that creates variation because there's mutations. Mutations constantly creating variation, and so there's an accumulation of that. And the more organisms also um, mate with one another, and so the more gene flow there is, the more mixing there is, the more you maintain genetic variability in populations. So the message from this figure is just that all these different species actually have maintained a good amount of genetic variation. They're not like some kind of scrawny inbred um, isolated population that's forced to mate with itself uh, and doesn't have very uh, high numbers and is just an offshoot of some other population very, very recently. All right, so if it had been recently and it had just been a few individuals left and they started a new population and they were forced to breed with each other, you would expect that they'd have very low frequencies of, of heterozygosity. All right, they'd be homozygous and they would have not much genetic variation overall. But that's not the case. So these all seem to be species or populations, represent individuals in populations that have been around for a while. In this case, for a while means tens of thousands of years, if not 100,000 years or more. And they have maintained relatively large populations during that time, allowing them to have all this genetic potential. Right. They're kind of typical of a lot of species on Earth for animals uh, that way. Remember, human beings are, are relatively, have relatively low amounts of genetic diversity, uh, not being a very old species. Uh, all right, so now this is the main figure. And this is really wanted to sh what I wanted to show my class. I've, I've said far more than I said to my class. I mostly just like said a few things about this and then went right to this figure in order to... <laughs> pound home my, my message from a couple lectures back. And that was, look, you know, it's hard to identify when a species becomes a new species, right? There, you have a common ancestor, and we were talking about polar bears and uh, brown bears, right? Polar bears are, the sister to polar bears is brown bears, right? They're the two most similar bears. And it seems pretty clear they have a common ancestor in the past, that then split into two populations, one of which ended up being, one of which was farther north, and those ones farther north adapted to the very cold climates of the Arctic and therefore derived all the features that make them polar bears, right? And brown bears are farther south and they've adapted to their particular uh, location. But that wasn't like one day there was a common ancestor, which was probably more brown bear-like, and then 
a generation later, there were polar bears. And I was like, they don't just pop into existence as completely different looking, completely differently adapted organisms, right? This is a gradual shift the population is undergoing. That's the same thing that's illustrated here. You see this 914,619 years ago? That comes from a calculation. Let's just say approximately a million years ago. How long has it been since coyotes and great wolves shared a common ancestor, right? Coyotes and great, coyotes and wolves are closely related species. I think everybody recognizes that. And part of the reason we'd recognize that is, well, they're, they're able to hybridize still, right? Um, but the genetic analysis suggests that it's probably been about a million years since they, since they were just one species. And there wasn't a distinction between these two different groups. And then you had them diverging while they lived in presumably different habitats, selected for different characters with different mutations, and they become more and more different over time. You know, so by the time you get to 100,000 years ago, you have fairly distinct species, something you would actually be able to identify. I mean, at 950 million years, uh, 950,000 years ago, 50,000 years later, you had you they had two separate populations, and maybe they had some little differences between them. But were they different species then? That would depend again on your definition. There's no one day in which it all of a sudden be like, oh, now there are different species. If you lived at that moment in time, what would you think? You would think, oh, this is kind of like eastern coyotes versus western coyotes. Right? There was one kind of coyote, and then some of them spread over to the eastern U.S. They've experienced different conditions, and they're, they're somewhat different. But, you know, honestly, they're just all coyotes. It's just a different variant of coyote. Well, what you're looking at is you're looking at the process. You're, you're looking at a step toward them becoming a new species. Now, what day they become a new species is all going to depend on how many differences you feel like they need to accrue before you, like, acknowledge, oh, they're different species. But eventually, coyotes and wolves... They become different species that are identifiable by everybody. Nobody disagrees that coyotes and wolves aren't different species. There's enough behavioral, physiological, morphological, and anatomical uh, and other genetic differences between coyotes and wolves that it's like every criteria is met other than what you might think is a really basic one, which is hybridization. But even then, as I explained before, they don't naturally hybridize very often in nature. We can artificially inseminate them or put them in a zoo or put them together and they will hybridize. But that's not really happening in nature, which is why the, the biological species definition in, actually includes typically a clause. Naturally, you know, it has to be something that happens really in nature. Na gene flow has to actually occur to stop speciation from happening. All right. So now back to this figure. I love this figure because it just shows how complex identifying species are and understanding species complexes and understanding that history is an ever morphing changing thing um, you have two different species and what they're saying is they have evidence that uh, from the genomes that the wolves divided later on into two separate distinct lineages right genetic lineages and then even morphological lineages because we can actually identify differences between eastern wolves and Alberta or western wolves or gray wolves. And they divided into two different populations. And they existed separately for some period of time. But at about 8,000 years ago, when the ice ages, you know, the ice is melting off, you had contact between the eastern and the western wolves. And that contact resulted in hybridization. Those hybrids then... Um, ended up reproducing with each other. So some of them stayed in a location where there was more hybrids, probably with some others that weren't hybrids, but eventually the hybrids came to cross with all the rest, and eventually you end up with a mixture of the two different wolves. So you have an intermediate. And that intermediate now has gained its own, you know, over 8,000 years, has selected out some traits, kept some other traits, and they become a, an actually identifiable genomic lineage themselves, even though they don't have a long-term history. So they're the result of hybridization and then their own unique attributes that then make them, uh, you know, adapted to their particular location. So what do you call them? I don't know. Some people call them a species. They're just a subspecies. Uh, they're just, they call them a hybrid. Just recognize them as hybrids. But all these things are just on their way to becoming something. We don't know what. The Great Lakes wolves, as long as they remain isolated, 
So what are the Great Lakes wolves doing? What are they going to become? Well, I don't know. Depends on whether they stay isolated or not. If they remain isolated for thousands of more years and thousands of generations, they might accrue enough differences. They'll clearly be a different species themselves. On the other hand, if some of the Great Lakes wolves wander over farther east and they intermingle with the eastern wolves more, and some eastern wolves wander over and manage to mingle with the Great Lakes wolves a little bit more than they are now, they could mix their gene pools together. In which case, the eastern and Great Lake wolves will, we'd have to draw a line. They would have to like re-come back together and just like, wow, both those species just melded back into one. In fact, I would argue that the eastern wolves and the western wolves, if there was dramatic climatic change and they were sort of compressed into an area that was more, they were more in contact with one another, I suspect that they might hybridize with each other much more often than they do now. And as a result, they could end up just blending their genes back together, right? Blending their genomes back into one big gene pool. In which case they would lose their distinctive features and they would just be an amalgam of the two, just kind of like the, the abstract said, right? They would become an amalgam of the two different species and they essentially would become one species again. So you have one species becomes two, long time ago, those two managed to, co to, to, to survive separately for long periods of time but they never quite made it to being completely, absolutely separate, distinct lineages such that they could never mix again. And when the opportunity arises and they mix again, they could just go back to being one species again. All right? Bifurcate and then rejoin. Coyotes, I guess it's still even possible that coyotes, if they became rare and then they became forced to live with wolves, they might hybridize with wolves and eventually the coyotes might go extinct and some of the coyote DNA will end up in wolves. That's what Eastern, uh, that's what our coyotes are here. They're actually a combination of Eastern wolves and coyotes, but they're more Eastern wolf than coyote. I'm sorry, they're more coyote than Eastern wolf. So they're coyotes that came from the West, interbred with some Eastern wolves, but they're most, and then they back brought, crossed with coyotes again. And so they just brought some Eastern gray wolf. I'm sorry, Eastern wolves. I'm getting all my canids mixed up. Eastern wolves, mix them a little bit back into the coyotes. And so our coyotes are not the same as a Western coyote for that reason. And that's another way in which essentially we're making a new species here, right? We've mixed some gene pools and now we're allowing them to be selected for, and they'll sort that out differently in this particular environment. Plus they're gonna have their own unique mutations. And it could be hundreds of generations from now, we'll have a very distinctive coyote that's in the Midwest that we could identify as a different species from the one on the east, eastern coast, and the western coast. All right, so species are this kind of fluid thing where um, species are in the process of dividing into new species, and really almost all species are in that process somewhere, right? There's different red fox lineages around the world, and they've been given, I think, 17 different subspecies names because they have identifiable different traits in those different populations in different parts of the world. Yet they're probably all still compatible because it hasn't been that long since they've dispersed and become these different populations. So every one of those 17 is, is on a trajectory to potentially becoming a new species. Some of them will become new species someday because they'll remain isolated. Some will be forced to rejoin or become live in the same geographical region again, and they'll mix their gene pools again, and they'll lose their distinctives, and they'll meld together into one species that isn't two subspecies anymore. Um, and so that is what's happening with all the species on Earth. And this is why it is so hard at times to pin down like just how many species there are. And we have names for them today, but honestly, those are just names for today, right? Tomorrow, they won't necessarily, those names can't stick around forever. And as we look back, and that's why, you know, now we're doing ancient DNA, right? With the mammoths, we're looking at ancient samples. You're comparing a 700,000-year-old mammoth with a 5,000-year-old mammoth. And you're seeing that the 700,000-year-old mammoth was still identifiable as a mammoth. But there was a whole bunch of new alleles and variants in the 5,000-year-old mammoth that the 700,000-year-old one didn't have. So that means the two, if they were brought together, they would probably look a little bit different and they're adapted differently. Not so much that there were different species yet, but 
you can see how they are changing over time and potentially if they had survived the descendants would be different species at some point all right so all of this is um a comp oh by on the left side sorry yeah your right side um this is just showing a uh, one possible network of how these uh, organisms are related to one another <laughs> over time and what percentage of their genomes are similar um, to one another. They have a bunch of other hypotheses they also tested, and that's all in the supplemental material. But that's not really critical for, for what I'm doing here. I'm just talking about why understanding what species are, are is, is a very complex thing to do. And so as you look at something like I got all these different populations. How am I going to identify them, right? We got some a lot of different tools. I can look at anatomy. I can look at uh, I can look at physical physiological errors. I could I could look at behavioral traits. I could look at specific sequences of DNA. I could trace their Y chromosomes. I could trace their uh, mitochondrial chromosomes to look at maternal lineages. And each one has its uh, flaws in terms of not necessarily giving you the full story of how these organisms are related. So as much as possible, we try to integrate all this different knowledge in order to sort of have the best idea of where are these lineages today and how are they related to other lineages. And we do our best job at sort of packaging things and saying like, let's call this thing a species. This other thing isn't quite different enough, so we'll call it a subspecies. But you see how this all plays into things like the Endangered Species Act? Yeah, one of the things about the Endangered Species Act is in order to know whether something is endangered, you have to know whether it's a species or not, right? And if you lump everything together, if I lumped all wolves across all North America together, well, they're not endangered. But if I say that there are some other wolves like the Mexican wolf that's distinctive and it has its own distinctive genetic lineage and it's different enough that I think we should call it a different species, well, it is endangered, right? That lineage is in danger of disappearing. Um, and so making those decisions end up being extremely critical decisions about what defines a species. All right, let's, uh, let's quit there. Um, that was just uh, like my uh, a little extended version of the intro to one of my lectures today uh, in, in, in one of my classes that I'm teaching. So hey, thanks for hanging out with me. Uh, we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.